Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Jennifer Vassell. Um, I'm a family doctor from Langley, BC, and I've been getting a lot of questions over the last uh, number of months regarding the safety um, and the mechanism of our mRNA vaccines against COVID-19. Um, and so I thought what I would do is put together um, a little video to explain how the vaccines work and answer some common questions. Um, uh, for my patients and for other fr friends and family that um, maybe are vaccine hesitant or, um, you know, just want to know, uh, you know, the facts from someone who um, is in healthcare, not from some other online source. So, um, first of all, uh, well, today we're only going to be covering the mechanism of the Pfizer um, or the Moderna vaccine. Um, we're not going to be um, discussing um, the uh, other types of vaccines that are out there are the protein based today. So um, I'm just going to start by explaining how the vaccine works um, and go through the mechanism and then after that we're going to do some questions. So Pfizer or Moderna both as you may know are mRNA vaccines. Uh, so these vaccines a couple things to know about them is that they're very unstable at room temperature. The reason I bring this up is a lot of people um, are fearful when they hear about these vaccines. Oh, you know, is this gonna be in my body for a long time? What's gonna happen after this is injected? Um, so mRNA, uh, as I say, is very unstable at room temperature. And for that reason, it has to be stored at minus 80 to minus 60 degrees Celsius. Um, and, and therefore, when we give this vaccine, we thaw it and we have it only at room temperature for a few hours before we inject it. Um, and that's so that we can give, you know, um, a, a good dose of the, of the mRNA in a stable uh, form before it um, is broken down at room temperature. Um, so the thing with this type of vaccine is, yes, it will break down at room temperature just naturally, but in our body, we also have these little Pac-Man, and I'm gonna talk about them later. They don't actually look like this, but uh, for the sake of today, <laughs> Um, these are little enzymes that are called um, RNases. So an RNase is an enzyme that breaks down RNA in our body. And for those of you that know a bit about biology, uh, you may remember um, that the way that our whole body works is that we have DNA that gets translated to RNA. The RNA then forms a protein. And that is essentially the flow of genetic information um, in almost all life forms. So uh, just to come back again to the mRNA again, so mRNA, um, it disintegrates within uh, the body with these enzymes, these RNases, um, and I think that's important to remember. This is something that's not gonna be in your body forever. Um, it's only in there for a very short time. Um, some estimates say that uh, the mRNA will be in your body for about 24 hours, but I think it's possible it could be even less than that, um, given you know what we know about the natural degradation of RNA usually within the body is within hours. Now it's a little different with a vaccine. Um, in the case of the vaccine, what we have is mRNA that's surrounded by this lipid or fatty coating, okay? And the fatty coating is such that uh, when the mRNA is injected into the bloodstream, it doesn't get immediately broken down um, by the RNAs that are actually in our bloodstream. Okay, so that's part of the design of the vaccine um, such that um, it can actually have a chance to affect our immune system and create a protective um, immune response for us. I also get a lot of questions from patients, well, what is mRNA? Some people don't um, have the background to talk about that and understand it. So mRNA is essentially, um, in layman's terms, it's a recipe card. So what it does is it tells your cell how to make one protein, okay? So every mRNA is like a recipe card for a protein. Now in this case, the mRNA vaccine is actually a recipe card for making one protein from COVID-19 uh, in this case, it's the spike protein. So the spike protein is what's found on the outside of the virus, and it's what you know the immune system will come in contact with uh, first. So if this is the virus, these little spikes on the outside, those are formed of proteins. And so what the mRNA vaccine is doing is teaching your body um, how to make that spike protein in order to then create a response. So let's talk about what happens once um, the mRNA has been, uh, the vaccine has been injected. So again, we have the um, mRNA contained within the lipofectin, which is this fatty coating, um, and it enters the bloodstream, and then it's, it circulates through the bloodstream, and then eventually it exits at any point that it wishes, and it encounters a cell. Now, because it has this fatty coating, it will essentially 
pass through the cell into um, into the in inside of the cell. Okay, so now we have the mRNA sitting inside of our cell. Now I think it's important to mention. I've had some patients tell me, well. You know, doesn't it enter the nucleus and become part of our DNA? No, it doesn't. So mRNA does not go backwards into the nucleus where our DNA is that allows us to be who we are. It has no interaction with that whatsoever. It actually stays within what's called the cytoplasm. So that's this part of, around, um, around the nucleus. It's not actually in there. So the mRNA then comes in and it finds this little thing called a ribosome. So a ribosome is sort of like a factory that helps to build proteins and it can read the code so the mrna code and it then forms a protein and there's a lot more steps in here but for, for simplicity today i'm just going to skip over this because it doesn't really affect um, the, the long-term message with this so then you have um, the spike protein so the spike protein is now produced um, and what it does then is it gets put on the outside of the cell and expressed like this so now you have this viral protein that's being expressed. Now the mRNA um, recipe card that was read in order to do this now gets broken down by one of these Pac-Man. This is an RNAs and it breaks it down inside the cell. So that's now essentially disappeared. It's no longer with us. It's not gonna be stored in any way. Um, and essentially it's completely useless now that it's broken down. So now we have this spike protein on the outside of the cell. And our immune system is very, very tuned into what are normal proteins for a body and what are abnormal proteins. So the immune system will bump into this protein and go, wait a minute, this doesn't look normal. This doesn't look like something I've seen before. And what it does is the particular immune cell that happens to bind with that protein undergoes a bunch of chemical changes such that it gets activated. So when the immune cell gets activated, what does it do? Well, it releases all sorts of chemicals. These are called cytokines, okay? So cytokines, these are chemicals um, that actually activate the immune response. They help the cells to proliferate, to, in other words, to make more of the ones that recognize the, the bad protein. Um, and they um, activate what are called T cells and B cells to make um, antibodies and to make um, fighter cells that will fight the presumed infection. Um, so it's important to know that with the immune, immune response, as I just said, you have a combination of antibody production and cell-mediated immunity. But it's important to know that you actually need two doses for this to, to be effective. So we know now that it takes two doses of both either Pfizer or Moderna to get more than 90% um, effectiveness in, in basically a reduction of getting the virus. Um, and the reason for that is when we start with this process of making these antibody um, producing cells or this uh, cell mediated immunity cells, they get produced, but when they encounter the, the protein a second time, they're ready for it. And this time they're really ready to amplify their response. So you can think of it kind of like the army. So, you know, at first they, they find this invader and they, they recognize it and they make a memory. Okay, so this is bad. We have to remember to look for this next time. So that the next time they encounter it, they're ready to fight and they have, um, they can produce a bigger response and they can be really prepared so that the third time, and hopefully the third time you encounter COVID isn't real COVID. Hopefully you never encounter it. But if you are to encounter it after two previous doses, your immune system is really ready to go and to fight the infection. So I think now what I'm gonna do is talk a bit about some of the common questions that people have. Um, and I'll try to use my diagram when I can. So one of the things that people often say to me, well, hold on a minute, um, doesn't mRNA change our DNA? Um, and so no, it doesn't. So mRNA and DNA are actually similar but different um, biochemical structures. For those of you that did um, you know, biology or maybe you went on to university courses on this, you'll know that they're actually made of um, a slightly different combination of building blocks. But suffice to say, DNA is a lot more stable than mRNA. DNA is also inside the center of our nucleus. Uh, it's not floating around in the cytoplasm and it doesn't get degraded by um, these little RNAs, okay? We don't have DNAs. Um, floating around in our, our body, we have RNAs, and that's because the way that our cells are, just, are um, structured is to have these messenger RNA or recipe cards like we talked about. 
Um, so again, the other thing to remember is that the mRNA that's injected with this vaccine is very unstable. And it's unstable due to the, just its chemical nature, but also because of these little enzymes that break it apart. So it's not gonna be in your body for any prolonged period of time. I think it's important to remember that this mRNA is gonna be gone probably within 24 hours, but possibly shorter than that. Now, the spike protein on the other hand is just a protein. Your body has made this protein. That will be in your body possibly for a few weeks, okay? But again, this is just a protein. You know, our body makes them all the time. Uh, this is something that has essentially been synthesized by your body. That will be there for a number of weeks, and that is how the immune response progresses. So some people will ask me about, well, hold on a minute. You know, what about other vaccination types? Like, why can't we have the old uh, vaccine style that I'm used to, not this mRNA thing? And I think it's important to remember that with COVID-19, the reason why um, this mRNA vaccine has become the most successful and most utilized is because of the fact that we needed a vaccine developed quickly, it had to be safe, and it had to be effective. Now, traditional vaccines, as you may know, are, are essentially skipping some steps. So instead of having the mRNA come in here and your body then creating the protein as we discussed, a traditional vaccine essentially just squirts some of this protein into your body. Okay, so it skips all this step here. Um, but the, the problem with that is in vaccine development is it's very difficult to actually do that quickly. Okay, so in order to make a protein, isolate it, um, amplify it, and then basically purify it and put it into a, a, a vaccine, that actually takes a really long time in the order of maybe years. And in this case, we didn't really have years to work with here. We had you know, many people dying from this terrible virus. We had to move forward. Um, but the other thing too is that these vaccines traditionally for other coronaviruses or that style of vaccine hasn't been found to be effective. And it's unclear why, um, but it is known that um, the mRNA vaccine uh, style of vaccination um, you know, fortunately does work against COVID, which is a coronavirus. But in the past, um, you know, there, there wasn't um, an effective vaccine for other coronaviruses. As you may know, um, you know, the common cold, some of the versions of the common cold is actually caused by other uh, coronaviruses. Now, these are not COVID-19. They're much weaker. They're not as, you know, um, they don't make you as sick. But we know that the traditional vaccine methods haven't worked to prevent those infections in the past. So this had to be kind of an innovative uh, method to doing that. Um, now, I think the thing to remember too is that I have some patients that ask me, well, wait now, you know, um, isn't this like, isn't it more natural for your body to get an infection um, and to actually have a real COVID, um, COVID infection and then have a COVID immune response from that? And what's interesting is that we've actually found that people who've had COVID-19 um, real infection have gone on to um, get infected again with another strain or another version of COVID. Um, so therefore, we think that true COVID infection does not prevent um, um, subsequent infection. Therefore, it doesn't create as, as potent of a long-lasting uh, immune response as vaccination does. Um, and I think the thing to remember as well, and I think this is a good point um, when you're considering this, is that the mRNA vaccine as a style of vaccine is actually the most uh, close mimic we can get to natural infection. So what some of you may not know is that viruses are essentially a coat of protein that surrounds some genetic material, okay? So in the case of DNA viruses, we have DNA in the center. In the case of RNA viruses, we have RNA in the center. But unlike bacteria, you know, other um, kinds of infections we can get from various organisms that are basically cells, like we have, Viruses are not a cell, so they are a protein that's surrounding um, a piece of, of genetic material. So when the virus comes in our body, similar to the vaccine, what it does is it goes into our bloodstream, similar to how we've designed this here with this coating and the mRNA, and then the, just as the vaccine does, the virus actually goes across the cell and puts its mRNA into our cell. So it's very interesting to remember that the vaccine actually mimics the style of natural virus infection very closely uh, to what would happen if you got real COVID. 
But in this case, instead of producing all of the products that are required to make the COVID virus, which would include the spike protein on the outside, other factors that create the shape of the virus and other things that are <clears throat> probably fairly complex, what we've done with our mRNA vaccine is we've only given the instructions to make one piece. Okay, so this vaccine cannot make the actual virus, that's not possible. Um, it actually just makes the one protein as we talked about, which is the spike protein. It does not form the entire virus. And I've had some patients ask me this, well, if I get the, the, the COVID shot, does that mean that I then have COVID in my body? And the answer to that is no. So you do not have the virus in your body. You only have one protein that is made um, from the mRNA vaccine. <clears throat> so I think it's important to remember that, that this, this uh, strategy is, is very akin to what a natural infection would do. But unlike a natural infection, it doesn't create more of the virus that can go on to then produce you know, serious health consequences for you. It just does um, create a very potent immune response. So I have other patients asking me, do I need to get vaccinated if I was unfortunate enough to catch COVID-19? And again, the, ac the answer to that is yes. So from what we gather, um, the immune response to natural infection is actually not as strong as the immune response we get to the vaccine. And we think that the vaccine will probably create a, an immune uh, protective state for anywhere, possibly six months, a couple of years. It's hard to know at this point, but certainly we think it's longer than with natural infection. Um, I've had a couple of patients who've gone down the rabbit hole online looking into some, we might say, conspiracy theories regarding the vaccine. Um, and one of them is this idea that uh, the spike protein somehow mimics um, this syncytial protein, which is found in the placenta, and that somehow this then creates a situation where the immune system is primed against a protein in the placenta and can affect fertility. Um, I've, I've actually, you know, tried to look this up online. I found absolutely nothing scientific that I would trust that validates this theory. And in fact, um, if, you, if you look into who's publishing this, who's putting this online, it comes from these anti-vax conspiracy theory people. Um, and, you know, really there's no bearing for that. And the other thing I will say is that, you know, the Society for Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Canada, which is a body that I trust, um, has come out and said that this vaccine is safe, it should be given to all women of childbearing age, and it should also be given to pregnant women. Um, and I think, you know, we have a, f a lot of experience with this vaccine now, being that it's the, um, you know, the largest, um, you know, vaccine campaign in, in human history, <clears throat> um, that we've seen this vaccine and what it can do um, in, in people, you know, on, in the order of millions of doses being given. And we haven't seen any effect whatsoever. There's been no sync signal that it's affecting fertility. And that'd be something that we would, we would find fairly early, I would, I would think. So again, there's no bearing for that. Um, so the other question I get is, well, what about the blood clots and the anaphylactic reactions? And what are the, you know, the bad things that this, this vaccine can do? So we know that um, very rarely any vaccine can cause an anaphylactic reaction. Usually it's you know, in the order of one in a few million. Um, pretty uncommon. And with COVID-19 vaccine, um, we do find that the uh, actual um, incidence of anaphylactic reaction is about 11 in 1 million doses. So again, very rare. And that's why after you have your COVID shot, um, what you'll find is that they're going to keep you um, at the vaccine location, they're going to monitor you, and the vast majority of these, um, these re reactions are going to happen within the first 15 minutes after your vaccine. The other thing that came about, particularly with um, the other style of, of um, COVID-19 vaccine, which we didn't touch upon today, but that's the AstraZeneca. Um, so that vaccine, um, as you may know, um, did cause fairly rarely this phenomenon called vaccine-induced thrombocytopenic thrombus, uh, or VIT. Um, and the incidence of that was about one in 100,000 essentially causing blood clots. And the blood clots um, many times over caused things like strokes, um, you know, um, ischemia to various organs. Uh, thankfully though, this is a very rare phenomenon. Again, it's about one in 100,000 and does not affect, I wanna underline that, does not affect uh, Pfizer or Moderna mRNA style vaccine to my knowledge. Um, the vast majority of patients after getting their Pfizer or Moderna vaccine will feel some um, you know, symptoms, and the symptoms that you're gonna get are coming from this release of cytokines. So it's actually your body's reaction to the vaccine that's causing the symptoms. 
Typically what people will get is um, maybe a low grade fever, they might get chills, they might get fatigue, they might get muscle aches, but these are short lived. And usually just with a bit of rest, within 24 hours they're completely gone. I've had many patients as well tell me that with both vaccinations, they had absolutely no response whatsoever. They felt fine. Um, and I can tell you that that's how I felt. I'm not sure what that means, whether, you know, I had COVID before, I have no idea. But um, anyhow, I, you know, I did get both of my doses. My first was in January of 2021. My second was in March of 2021, given that I'm in healthcare and I had um, virtually, um, you know, no response to it. So the other thing I get questions about is pregnancy. So I have a lot of patients who are nervous about getting their vaccine in pregnancy. What I wanted to quickly talk about there is what we know that COVID can do to a pregnant woman. So we know that when a pregnant woman catches COVID, she has about a 10% chance of getting admitted to hospital and she has about a 1% chance of death, which is, you know, terrible. Um, and so, you know, certainly this is um, far worse than, you know, the fatality or hospital admission rate for women with um, influenza. And we know that every year, many women who catch influenza when they're pregnant get very ill. So I would look at this as like, you know, a super virus, much worse than influenza. Absolutely pregnant women should get vaccinated. And we know that that is the way to keep them and the baby safe. Um, I get a lot of patients asking me questions about this being a new technology. They don't want to be a guinea pig. So um, I wanted to talk a bit about the history of the vaccine and, and how it came about. So these vaccines were developed um, originally back in 2012. Um, they were entering phase one trials, and this was in response to the uh, original um, SARS-CoV-1 um, or you know, SARS epidemic that was mostly in Toronto in 2003, I think it was. <clears throat> and these phase one trials um, were looking at a, what, would, what at that time was a DNA vaccine, uh, but essentially the same mechanism. But if we go back in time, in the 1980s, there was a research group called Malone et al that started uh, looking at RNA vaccine to treat um, medical illnesses. And in 1993, we had Martinson et al with the first mRNA vaccine done in a research lab. Okay, so this technology has been around for a long, long time. Currently, we actually have mRNA vaccines for things other than COVID. And some of you may not have heard about this, but we have them for the Zika virus, for cytomegalovirus, and they're gonna be developed likely for influenza and para-influenza as well. So similar to that, I have some patients say, well, how is this safe? You know, this hasn't been studied enough. And again, I would say, you know, the fears that people have around that, the way that we study vaccine is usually we do trials, which is which were definitely done in this case, where we followed a small number of patients. And then in the second um, order of the trial, we had more patients enrolled and we monitored them for immediate reaction to the vaccine, later reaction. And then we get to a, what we call um, stage three clinical trial, whereby we're monitoring everyone who's gotten the vaccine. People that deliver vaccine or healthcare providers can report if a patient has any kind of illness that they de uh, determine um, could be related to the vaccine and those then get reported. So we've now been recording these since essentially um, the vaccine's been rolled out. I, I believe it was late December, um, early January. And so far, um, there hasn't been um, you know, anything significant on that front uh, to report. Um, the thing with this, and as far as safety, I recognize that some people feel safer when something's been around for a really long time, um, and that's how they derive safety. But I would say that safety, it's probably a better way to measure it is what happens when you give it to lots of people. So not just you know small amounts of people over time, but if you give it to a lot of people and you study them, what happens to them? And if there's going to be something wrong, it's going to show up in that large group of people that receive the vaccine. Um, and I think the thing to remember with this is that, yes, there is a theoretical but small chance of reaction to the vaccine, but there's real um, consequences to catching COVID. So we know that um, some patients are unfortunate enough to get respiratory failure, end up in the ICU. Um, but I think, you know, the, the other thing is to consider you know, friends and family, if you were to then catch the virus and send it to a friend or family uh, member, that obviously can have, you know, serious health consequences for them. But the thing I want to just briefly touch upon is what we call long COVID. So long COVID is essentially, we think, um, a process that probably involves the release of these cytokines well beyond the time of your natural COVID infection, thereby creating a, a situation where you feel like you're sick with COVID, you feel tired, you feel 
brain fog, you have muscle aches, um, you have um, you know headache, um, but it's lasting far longer than the, the infection should last. So in other words, the virus has cleared, but yet your immune response to this natural infection has created this problem for you. Um, and we see that you know the, the percentage on this is 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 actually higher than people want to really admit. It's probably um, you know anywhere from uh, one in five to one in three people will have symptoms up to six months after their infection. Commonly, we see patients having you know a loss of sense of smell and taste, which was isn't really long COVID, although it can linger for many months. I've seen up to six months in many of my patients who've caught COVID. But, but really, we're more talking about this, this effect of what we call long COVID. And certainly, long COVID can affect adults, it can affect children, it can affect teens, it can affect anyone. So catching this virus and getting over it, even if it is a mild course, doesn't mean you're going to have a smooth, uh, a smooth course thereafter. It's possible that you'll be one of the people that's unfortunate enough to catch long or to end up with long COVID. Um, so I think I'm going to end there. Um, it's been a... Oh, longer video than I expected. Um, but I, uh, if you have any questions, please post them below. I'm happy to try to answer them as I can. All right. Bye-bye.